And now a reading uh, from the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I, therefore, that is the Apostle Paul, the prisoner uh, in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the full measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery and their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, and now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, I uh, am I'm glad to be back. I was gone last weekend. Uh, my, my family and I, we took a little break, a little vacation uh, to get some rest. And that is always a challenge for me because I like going and going and going. And I, but I did what I would tell other people to do. I, I, I set my phone uh, to silent. I put it in another room. I went out and uh, enjoyed some time together with some friends up in the forbidden uh, territory of Michigan. And uh, it was great because all we did was basically sit around a pool. Uh, and there were moments there where relaxing in the sun with nothing better to do. Like you, you feel like this is the life. This is the life. I like that feeling. You know, and that's not a feeling that comes every day. But when I came home and I came back uh, into church last night and this morning and here with you today, you know, I get the same feeling. I, because I love what we have here at Trinity. I love being a part of, of this group of people. I love being a part of our community here in Ashland. And when I get home, it's like, man, this is the life. This is really good. As a matter of fact, when I think about the question of our lives that we live in Christ. That question that the Apostle Paul is writing about uh, as he writes to the church in Ephesus, he says that there is, in fact, a life that we've been called into. But when we think about uh, the life that, that we'd like to be called into, you know, more often I think it looks like the vacation than it is the time that we spend together, maybe in church or in our, in our homes, in our community. We'd like to get to a place where we can say this is the life. But if it's true that we've been called into something, that we've been called out of an old way of being and into a new one, that God has poured out his gifts upon us, called us to be members of his family, dwelling in his kingdom, well, what, what does that look like? What is it supposed to be? Yeah, I think we misunderstand that quite a bit. When we think about the life that we've been called into, I think as Christian people, what we want to do is we want to say, well, if we were really living the life that God wanted for us, you know what our life would be like? It would be amazing. Uh, there would never be any difficulty or suffering because we'd never be making mistakes. We would be free from sin and from all of the pain that comes uh, through that. It would be just terrific. 
And maybe as we go, we'd receive all of the material blessings that we want, just like the people who were following Jesus uh, during his own time. Well, they want more food. They want more good stuff. They want God to be sprinkling out the gifts. And I'm not going to lie. I mean, that'd be great. But I think it's unreasonable for us to assume that, well, that's what the, the Christian life is supposed to be like. And you know what? There are folks, I think, that, that imagine that if we just had it down, if we were living the life that Christ wanted for us, that our neighbors would look at us and they'd think like, man, these folks got it together. If only my life was like their life. That if they could see what it meant to live as a Christian, that what we would be uh, displaying through our own, our own life together would be so amazing that who, who wouldn't want to be a part of it? You know, uh, and while all of those things sound great, they aren't exactly the life that we have been called into. And we know this because we can look at our own lives as God's people, and, and our lives are really normal lives. But we also affirm this, that we've been saved from something. We've been saved from a certain life, and we've been given a new life. And that this life is so good and so blessed that, you know what, there is a way where we should be able to look at what we've been given uh, by God and say, this is the life. Man, I'm so lucky to be living it. And that we should be able to talk to the world and, and to let them know that, you know what, there's a life that's better than the life we choose for ourselves. It's a blessing. And God wants you to be a part of it. He's, he's already welcomed you into it. Because I think the world looks at our Christian faith and they think, well, what's in it for me? What kind of life would I have if I were to be a Christian? And they see that though there are some out there who are saying that there might be all of the great material blessings and everything might be perfect. They see our lives and and the ways that things work in the world, and they know, well, well that isn't exactly going to be it, is it? And so what is it that, that God is, has loved us so much that he has that he's blessed us with in Christ? It's a life that's different. It's a life that's better. As a matter of fact, it's the most important uh, thing that we could ever speak about or ever know, ever have the ability to share with one another, because the life that we share, God calls salvation— the life that we share, he calls the gospel, the good news. The life that we share is his power for saving people. And this is God's gift to you, and it's God's gift for the entire world. And it is uh, a gift that is timeless. Because you know what? Um, we see it, the necessity of it. We see what God is solving in Christ from the beginning even to this present day. The Apostle Paul is writing uh, to one of his churches that he has started, the church in Ephesus. And the Ephesian church, I think if you look at the entire New Testament, you feel like it's a pretty decent church. You know, they've got their problems, but we all have our problems. And the church in Ephesus, the kinds of challenges that it, were, that it was facing, well, they're kind of age-old challenges. But they... They manifest themselves in a certain way in the early church. You know, the, the problem that people have is that we don't tend towards unity. You know, the life that we share here at Trinity, like we look around the room and we're a part of a small-ish community in Ashland, right? It's a small town. I love it. it's got small town vibes and the whole thing. It's just a, a warm and welcoming community. And most of us know one another even in a context outside of church. But I'll tell you what, I can prove that God grants unity as a gift and that this is what he wants because here we all are in this room and like I've been here for a handful of years. This is the only time we all get together, right? All for one cause, to gather around the word of God. It has a power to draw people together. It has a power that brings unity. That though we might, uh, we might like one another as friends, as neighbors, we aren't always drawn together. As a matter of fact, that aside from church, just, or our community, even our homes, like there's, there's always a necessity of being drawn together. Because life kind of pulls us apart, doesn't it? But God promises that the gift of new life in Christ is a gift of unity, a gift of peace. It's what he wants for his people. 
And if it doesn't look like the world filled with material blessings and everything's just as perfect as, as it can be constantly, well, what could it be if we were living the life that we've been called into? Now, the, the Apostle Paul, like he's writing to his church, they have their, their challenges. Their challenges are the challenges of that day. In the early church, there were divisions. For folks that imagine when they, when they talk about like the ideal church, we want it to be like the New Testament church. It's like the New Testament church was a divided church, man. I don't want that. Right? I, want, I want to feel the unity that God has uh, blessed us with in Christ. The divisions in that day were different than the divisions that we have in our society today. But they're divisions uh, nonetheless. In the early church, uh, and in the church of Ephesus specifically, the Apostle Paul writes at first to Jewish believers— Folks who had uh, come through uh, an upbringing in Judaism who believed initially that, hey, we're God's chosen people. Uh, they have all of the blessings that God wanted to pour out. They, they have the law. They have the, the scriptures. And now they have Jesus. And they thought, man, this is great. And they were right. It's great. God had chosen them, but he had chosen them in Christ. But there gathered with them were a new group of people, the Gentiles, and they had a very different way of looking at the world. You know, they didn't grow up with the same traditions, with the same scriptures, with the same ideas. Those people came with very different ways of, of living, of acting, of dressing, of speaking, of thinking about the world and their place inside of it. And in the space in between the Jewish believers and the Gentile ones, God had given Christ so that they could be brought together, that they could live together and experience the peace and the unity that God wanted to bring into being through Christ Jesus. He had given them a gift that could tie them together. But what was happening in that church is they were still divided. You know, in, in the church in Ephesus, it was those, uh, those things that didn't matter as much is what God has done for people that we're allowed to divide, that we're allowed to separate. And because of that, the way that those people looked at each other, spoke about each other, the way they treated each other, they, they destroyed the gift little by little that Christ had died to bring. Now, this is not the life that we've been called into, and that's why the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, I'm begging you. You want to live this life, I promise you. Live the life that is worthy of the calling that, you've been, that you have received in Christ. Live a life of peace and unity. But what he points out is that uh, there's going to need to be some changes. You know, he initially writes in the, uh, the first part of this book to the Jewish believers. In the second part, he's going to write to the Gentiles. And if you read on, he's going to point out that there are things on each side that need to be laid down. There's some deconstruction that needs to happen here. For the Jewish believers, they have to stop believing that the blessings that they have received through birth and through, in a sense, accident— that those things can't be used to lift themselves up over and against their neighbors. For the Gentiles, he's going to point out that, like, listen, there are some things that you guys have done in the past that aren't really a part of the life that, that God's calling you into. And each party has a point, but each party also has something that they need to let go of. That in order to live the life that, that they could live together in unity, part of that old life is going to have to fall away. Now, this is uh, the classical case of disunity in the New Testament. It happens in churches uh, in, uh, that we read about in other epistles. We know from the Revelation that it is the common problem. And we ourselves might say, well, that's no longer a problem for us. But division is still the problem for humanity. This is the problem that has been from the beginning. That all of the scriptures testify that from the beginning, once you have people who are relating themselves to God, Adam and Eve, what happens? Well, division. How? Well, through sin. And that isn't what God desired for Adam and Eve, and he wanted to make a way for them. But immediately after that, we see the story of who? Their descendants, Cain and Abel. 
And now it isn't God and man, but brother and brother. And those same divisions. That where there was unity, togetherness, family, love, there are things that pull us apart. And wedges that get driven in, in between. And so often what fills that space is resentment that turns to hatred, it turns to violence. Things that, that solidify and perpetuate the divisions between us. And this is a timeless problem because it might have been the problem from the beginning and it might have been the problem 2,000 years ago in the church in Ephesus, but it is absolutely the problem in our society today, is it not? Because how many of us if we, if we imagine that there is indeed a life of unity and peace that, that is available to us through Christ, don't imagine that it would be better if we had it right now. It would be better if we could live at peace with one another, but we don't. And there is no use in, in applying slogans over and over again. We're all in this together. But because we, we really aren't. And we can see over the past years of political turmoil and, 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 uh, and civil difficulties here in our country, we can look around the world and abroad, but we don't even need to go that far. We can look inside of our community, inside of our homes, inside of our hearts, and we can see that there is, in fact, division. That we don't live in the unity that God desires for us. We don't have peace between one another that Christ came to give. And so this problem, it isn't a problem that we look back on and we think like, oh, I could learn about that. But it's today's problem. It's your problem and it's mine. What do we do with all of this division? Because Christ has died to give us a new life. He promises that there's a way, that there, there's a, a way we can live and a day that can be brought into being where we could sit back and look at it and say, you know what, this is the life. This is what we were meant for. And we may have a taste of it in a place like church, but the truth is, is Christ came to redeem the whole world. It's for, for the world that he died. So what do we do? You know, the, the world, I think, wants peace. But the world is so good at creating division. And when we, uh, when we are not living in Christ, we're not doing the things that Christ has called us into, living the life that he himself lived and, and showed us and participating in the redemption that he wants to bring, we're a part of the division in the world. Make no mistake, Christ has come with only one weapon, the weapon of forgiveness, of mercy and grace to heal division. It's what removes those things that are placed in between us so that we can come together. Because apart from forgiveness, how could there be unity? One side has to win. And if there's one side and another, then we're fighting and we're divided. And that's the world that we live in. And the world that we live in is accelerating towards something that's even worse. Because nowadays you can not only see that there are indeed ways that, that folks are different, but now we learn how to divide a thousand new ways. You could get a degree if you want. Uh, in dividing this world. It's as though uh, if the world were a pie to be sliced into pieces, how do you like to do it? Have and have not? Good and bad? Right and wrong? Black and white? Left and right? It doesn't matter how you slice the pie because the problem is that we don't have something to share. The world uh, is working to make divisions where they do not need to be so that one side can win against the other. And if you think that coming into church uh, places you on one side of that, I'm telling you, that isn't the life. That isn't what we've been called into. But instead, we've been called uh, together to say, let's put it down, put the knife down, that this thing that we've received here that, as a gift, this life, is meant to be shared. It is not meant to be divided. It is not meant to tear us apart. It is not meant to uh, be divvied up so that fairness or a certain uh, outcome can come into being. 
but instead so that we can gather around something good and share in it together. It's meant for unity. It's meant for peace. It's meant for blessing. But not everyone has it. And now, as a church, as a group of people with, with a word and with a spirit that can overcome this, we see that the world also comes to attack us as well. And make no mistake that on the side of, uh, of that pie that is being sliced by some, we're on the outside. We're the thing that needs to car- be carved away in the minds of many. The world has been and continues to be and to grow more so hostile to the teaching of Jesus. Because the teaching of Jesus, I think the world understands, won't allow for that division. It's the teaching of Jesus about forgiving one another that has the power to overcome this thing. Now, I'll tell you what. um, If you were to confront somebody who has a hostile bent towards what we do as God's people, because we do some stuff around here. You know, we love this, uh, this gospel word. We love this idea that God has forgiven sinners like us. We love the idea that he has done so for the entire world. And we go forth from this place and we say, you know, we need to share this word with other people. We need the world to see and to understand that there's a way that we can live together in peace. There's a way that the divisions that we have can be healed and brought together. There's a way that we can love one another without changing and destroying one another. But if you were to talk to somebody who is not keen on that idea, you know, they'll point out that, hey, the work that you're trying to do, it's destructive. And to give uh, credit where it's due, the work of the gospel is a destructive work at first. You see, it demands of us that we set down part of our life. And it demands of all who hear it that to be a part of this unity and this peace, that we have to set down the things that divide us, the things that we hold against our neighbors, we have to forgive and so yes it is destructive and where a culture exists that raises up negativity and hatred and division and strife and enmity where those things exist absolutely the work uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to destroy those things so that built up in their place is forgiveness and grace This is the life. This is what God has called us into. And I'll tell you what, that as Christian people, my prayer for you is that you have in your sights those same things that the Apostle Paul saw and believed, that even as he was looking at the divided world in front of him, and as you look at a divided world in front of you, is that there is a day coming and a way that you can live in this life that can help to bring an end to the divisions. That through grace and mercy and peace and forgiveness that we can be done with the divisions that pull us apart and instead we can be brought together. That all of the things that that divide and that, that we see wrong with the world, that we can be a part of making them right. And this is God's gift. This is the life that we've been called into. And with the Apostle Paul, I beg you, let's live together a life worthy of the calling that we've received in Christ Jesus with all humility, with all patience, to be sure, but bearing with one another in love. Let us, let us strive for that unity and peace that God has died to give us in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for you, uh, Lord, have called us out of a life that we, that we choose for ourselves a life that divides us from our neighbors, one from another, that seeks to lift ourselves up over and against uh, uh, those who are different than we are. But Lord, you came to heal those divisions. And so remove first from our hearts 
uh, those things that separate us from our neighbors, Lord, those things that we hold against one another, those grudges and judgments, Lord, uh, fill us with a heart of forgiveness and mercy and grace, that we might forgive those uh, who have sinned against us, that we might be forgiven and accept forgiveness for the ways that we have sinned. And from that place, Lord, let us go forth living, living that gospel, that we might be able to, at last, both in your presence ultimately, but in this life as well, come to a place where we can, we can look around at the unity and the peace, those things that we desire so deeply, and say, this, this is the life to which we have been called. Bless us in this endeavor. We pray through the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.